fresh water constitutes only 2.5% of the Earth's water resources. Poland is in the group of countries threatened by water deficit. Taking into account our hydrological conditions and geographical location within the range of a moderate climate, water resources in Poland are small. The diversity of the elements of water balance, precipitation, evaporation and outflow results from the differences in climate and land relief. The clash of continental and oceanic influences causes high seasonable variability and unpredictability of precipitation. The location of Poland in relation to the ocean also influences the amount of precipitation, which is decreasing as it goes from the ocean into the continent, from west to east. Therefore, precipitation in Poland is lower than in most European countries. In addition, snowless winters, frequent in recent years, pose another problem. Lack of snow and the water stored in it, which in turn feeds surface and underground waters, adversely affects the entire country's water resources and water balance. Forests have a beneficial effect on valuable hydrological resources, providing water protection and retention. They are of great importance for the quality of water and the condition of the rivers that flow through them, and these rivers in turn hold many secrets. Forest rivers. Mountains. This is where the moisture pushed by the winds rises over the ridges and then cooling down forms clouds from which rain falls, giving rise to a wealth of fresh water. Although not all rivers start their course in the mountains, our journey begins here. Over time, the streams of water merge and grow stronger, turning into rushing torrents. They often form spectacular waterfalls and agitated whirlpools. As a result, the water is highly oxygenated. Few organisms have adapted to life here. Those that have managed to do so have had to develop some mechanisms to enable them to survive. The bullhead is alarmed by movement near the egg deposit, which it cares for. It moves closer to recognize its attacker. It's a caddisfly larva. It could devour the eggs. Fortunately, it has found another bite, so the intervention of the male will not be necessary. Caddisflies spend most of their lives underwater, protecting their fragile bodies in houses shaped like sleeping bags. They build them from available materials such as grains of sand or fragments of plants. They usually feed on organic matter of animal origin, and some species are predators. Initially, in their upper courses, the rivers pass through areas covered with spruce forest. As the terrain levels out, willow thickets appear.
The herbaceous plants that catch the eye here are the loose stripes in bloom. Sometimes it is possible to observe a hunting dipper. It is the only songbird that can dive and swim. It can stay underwater for up to half a minute thanks to membranous flaps on its nostrils which prevent water from entering its respiratory system. Its food includes mayfly larvae. These insects spend the first few years of their lives underwater and then emerge, often in large numbers, in the mating flight that ends their lives. Weakened by sky hopping, the individuals fall into the water, where they are eagerly collected by grayling that hunt them. As the river runs, the landscape changes. There are more and more deciduous trees. The contrasting spotted salamander lives its secret life in dark nooks and crannies near the water. This amphibian is inseparably connected with water. In the lower places, we can come across beavers. The floodplains resulting from their work create excellent living conditions for amphibians. Common frogs and toads are the first to begin mating. A few days later, when the water warms up slightly and vegetation starts growing, the pools seem to turn blue. These are more frogs in their mating outfits. The blue color appears in males only during a short period of spring. Sometimes, in the lovemaking exaltation, there is a confusion between different species. Recently, a significant decrease in the population of native anurans has been observed. The general chemicalization of the environment and disappearance of natural reproduction habitats of these friendly creatures are responsible for this state of affairs. On flat ground, the rivers run slower. They now contain more organic ingredients and the water is considerably warmer. Here too, beavers slow the river down wherever they can with their dams. The recently hatched tadpoles quickly develop in the shallow, sun-warmed water. Despite the excellent conditions for development, many dangers await them here. 
the larva of the great diving beetle or the voracious dragonfly will readily feed on an unwary tadpole. Those that succeed in growing up happily will leave the water to return with subsequent springs, giving life to new generations. For the larva of the hawker dragonfly, the end of its aquatic life has come. It has spent the last few years underwater hunting all sorts of small creatures. If all goes well, the world of the skies will soon be open to it. This is a difficult and dangerous moment. During the transformation, the insect is quite defenseless. It has succeeded. The inaccessible wetlands are a habitat for wild plants and animals. The moist, fertile soil is home to earthworms and grubs in large numbers and is an excellent buffet for wild boars. Cranes eagerly breed here. Their nest surrounded by water gives the birds a sense of security. They announce the occupation of their territory to the world with a characteristic call of spring, the clangor. The spring sun stimulates the vegetation. The yellow star of Bethlehem blooms. This roe deer is still accompanied by last year's fawn, but their paths will soon diverge. The mother is about to give birth and is looking for a quiet place where no one will bother her during this intimate moment. Where the water flows swiftly, fish thrive. Common minnows. These small fish live in flocks in shallow, cool, fast flowing waters with rocky bottoms. The spawning season has just begun. During this period, the males exhibit intense mating coloration.
In both sexes, there is a so-called spawning rash in the form of light blue spots on the head. The chubs are hoping for a free meal in the form of spawn. In the small rivers of Pomerania, the brook lamprey is mating. Due to the increasing pollution of streams and rivers, this is a very rare species. The spawning takes place in quite a strong current, so the female holds onto a stone and one of the males wraps around her, squeezing the eggs. External fertilization occurs. The female lays about 1,000 eggs, from which the larvae hatch. They live at the bottom for four to five years, after which they transform into adults. Adults do not feed at all, as their digestive system is retrograde. Immediately after the metamorphosis, they start spawning, after which they die in a short time. Although it has fins and gill openings, it is not a fish. Lampreys belong to a different class of vertebrates, the jawless. They are living fossils from ancient times. By the pillar of the old bridge, in a place with a calmer current, a small but very belligerent stickleback guards its fry. Like a clownfish in a film, it protects its offspring and is able to chase away even a larger aggressor. Such behavior is not unusual in our ichthyofauna. Similar care for their offspring is shown by catfish and zanders. Rivers flowing through the forest are self-cleaning. Tree roots and lush vegetation act as a natural filter and the beneficial shade lowers the water temperature, limiting the excessive growth of microorganisms, including protozoa, responsible for the turbidity of water. The good quality of the water is evidenced by the animal species found in it. In order to thrive, this graceful fish needs the presence of a duck mussel or mollusk in which it lays its eggs. Bivalve freshwater mussels and duck mussels are natural indicators of clean water. They feed by filtering the water of organic particles with siphons. The presence of the mussel is of great interest to the bitterling. They and other fish species also contribute to one of the developmental stages of these mollusk larvae by being their hosts. The larvae of bivalve mollusks are parasites that inhabit the gills and skin of fish. 
the muscles and the bitterling thus derive mutual benefit from each other's existence. Small rivers are also home to shrimp-like crustaceans, gammarids. Sometimes they are found in large numbers. They feed on all sorts of organic debris, themselves providing a tasty morsel for fish and birds. As recently as the early 20th century, the waters of Central Europe were full of noble crayfish. Unfortunately, in the 19th century, a deadly disease for European crayfish, the crayfish plague, was imported from North America. This one here is a striped crayfish, resistant to this infection. It was imported from America. Better able to withstand water pollution and hypoxia, it began to displace the noble crayfish from many areas. At present, the main threats to the survival of the native species are river regulation, disease, pollution and over-fertilization of water, and competition from invasive species, the striped crayfish and the signal crayfish. In their lower sections, the rivers become wider and flow lazily through the plains. Here, in Boretuholske, the river Vda is aspiring to be the largest in the region. It is May, and Vimba Breams are just starting to spawn. They prefer sections with a hardstone bottom. They are wanderers. During the period of reproduction, they undertake long journeys, leading a nomadic lifestyle. They move from the coastal waters of the Baltic Sea to the Podkarpatskia region. Unfortunately, their migration is becoming increasingly impossible as a result of hydro-engineering works being built across rivers. The proximity of water in the specific microclimate cause lush growth of vegetation, which, overgrowing the banks, constitutes an inaccessible barrier for daredevils who want to get through it. It is a real jungle. Someone who has not been in such wild places does not realize how difficult they are to cross. And then there are those ubiquitous blackberries. However, the animals moving along their own known paths find places where they can quench their thirst. The fruiting plants provide food not only for birds, but also for the stately chub. These majestic fish can grow to a considerable size. Sometimes they hunt actively.
In places with a calm current, common pond skaters glide on their long legs. They are predatory, feeding on insects that fall into the water. But they are not the only ones hunting here. One of the functions of the forest is tourism. Resting by the water on sunny days is a perfect relaxation. Canoeing attracts volunteers craving for contact with nature, who are not afraid of the hardships of such rafting. It is a real adventure for persistent explorers of forest nooks and crannies, and at the same time a great lesson in nature. The presence of kayaks worried the trout preparing to spawn. Their perfectly streamlined shape allows them to stay practically motionless in the stream against the advancing water current. This is a very useful skill to prevent energy loss in these cold waters. After the exciting struggle, it is nice to dry off by the campfire and have a warm meal. In the state forests, there are places specially prepared for this. Water in the forest, including that stored in small retention facilities, creates particularly attractive places, especially for birds. One of the most interesting is the black stork. It has an excellent feeding ground here, which increases the chances of successful breeding. So-called protection zones are created around the nests of these birds. Large rivers, if they have the opportunity, end their course naturally, creating huge deltas, which are ideal habitats for wetland birds and fish. The lowlands, touched by floods every year, create specific conditions for the occurrence of lush and inaccessible willow and poplar riparian forests. It is also a forest, different than we usually imagine in our latitudes. Cormorants find excellent conditions here for raising their chicks. 
The key to breeding success is a rich feeding ground. However, when the numbers of these birds increase excessively, they can threaten local fish populations. Birds of various species visit such areas in large numbers during the breeding season and seasonal migration, creating an amazing atmosphere and naturally unique places teeming with life. True enclaves of primeval nature. winter. There is a stillness in nature. The trees, standing in mute majesty, have taken on snowy foliage. The forest seems to have stopped. But this is only an illusion. Life goes on only slower. Rivers, even if they are not covered by ice, slow down their pace. This also applies to the organisms living here. Invertebrates of all kinds, fish and amphibians are cold-blooded animals whose metabolism slows down considerably as the temperature drops. Beavers do very well in winter conditions. Their warm furs protect these animals from wind and frost even when wet. larger rivers, the temperature at the bottom is constant at around 4 degrees Celsius. Fish congregate in deeper places with calmer currents, rarely taking food. Otters benefit from the winter numbness of cold-blooded animals. They never lack energy. Every now and then they fish out tasty morsels and have fun doing it. In recent years, the problem of water scarcity and related droughts has intensified. This is a result of both increasing anthropopression and climate change. Illegal quad and motorbike crossings have recently become a scourge, destroying rivers and forest sections. The widespread chaotic urbanization process and the accompanying sealing of catchment areas contribute to a change in the balance of water resources. The acceleration of rainwater runoff disturbs the natural water cycle. This is particularly visible on the borders of forest biotopes, where a beautiful wild river flowing through the forest ends its life changing into a reclaimed canal and finally disappears completely on a large area of arable farmland.
Then there is untreated sewage and thoughtless littering of waters, often creating a deadly trap for all sorts of living creatures. Forests today are refuges of wild rivers. Here we have a unique opportunity to observe still natural processes occurring in the natural environment. We cannot afford to not save such valuable biotopes, which is known to foresters who protect wetlands and carry out many small retention projects in sustainable forest management. A river naturally meandering among trees, not enclosed in concrete frames, clean, aerated, with fallen branches forming depressions carved out by the current, is the essence of nature, a natural habitat and breeding place for fish and other organisms associated with this environment. <laughs>